When I was in college, I would take a lot of walks in the woods behind my dorm. I'd never felt uneasy until one afternoon, I was on a trail I'd walked on a hundred times before. Then all of a sudden, I felt like someone was watching me. I turned around to see if someone was there, but nobody was. Perking up my ears, I listened. Nothing, except the usual sounds of the woods. Even so, the strong impression remained that someone was staring at me. I sighed in exasperation at myself. Nobody was there, so nobody could be watching me. I turned back around and gave a start. A guy was standing about a hundred feet down the trail, completely motionless, staring at me. I couldn't see his face that well, but he was close enough so that I could see he was smiling. It was not a friendly smile. It reminded me of an evil clown smile without the makeup. I waited a few seconds to see if he moved, but he didn't. He stood absolutely still, the smile unwavering. It made me feel really uneasy. I didn't know what else to do, so I decided to acknowledge him with a little wave. He didn't wave back, he just kept staring at me. By this time, my uneasiness had ramped up to the next level. I wanted to walk away, but I didn't want to turn my back. I also didn't want to go towards him. The safest route seemed to be to walk parallel to him. It would mean getting off the trail, but at least I could keep him in my peripheral vision. In the split second I turned to get off the trail, the stranger vanished. I looked all around me, but there was no sign of anyone. Instead of feeling relieved, I felt even more uneasy. Was he hiding somewhere or creeping behind the trees? It's probably just someone trying to be funny, I told myself. I started picking up my pace, trying to look as casual as possible because I was sure he was still watching. I wasn't too far from my dorm at least. I got back on the trail. I'd only be in the woods a few more minutes. I turned around just to make sure he wasn't there. Drawing my breath in, I saw him far behind me, standing motionless, the smile visible on his lips. I started walking even faster, although I tried to keep myself from looking back. I kept imagining him coming up from behind me, reaching out his hands to strangle me and smiling. Finally, I stole a glance over my shoulder. He was gone. I was practically out of the woods, emerging into the sunlight. I'd never been so happy to see my dorm building. I broke into a run. I didn't care if the guy saw me at this point. Punching in the code of the door, I looked one last time at the woods, half expecting to see him standing at the edge. He wasn't. Feeling much better, I went up to my room. Opening my door, I saw my roommate, looking out the window towards the woods. You don't see anyone out there, do you? I asked because I just had the creepiest thing happen. He turned to look at me, and I realized it wasn't my roommate. It was him, still staring and smiling. I was returning from a business trip and had spent eight hours on the road with six left to go. The freeway had ended and I was snaking through a wooden two lane highway somewhere in the West Virginia Hills. I didn't like it. It was remote, and there weren't many cars on the road. That was unsettling enough, but the overcast sky made it worse. It was near dusk, and I knew I'd have to stop for the night soon. The twisty, hilly roads were bad enough during the day. I didn't even want to consider driving them at night, and hoped there would be a decent hotel nearby. I'd rather sleep in my car than in the ratty motels I'd mostly seen so far. Then the woods abruptly ended as I drove into a small town. It had seen better days. The buildings were sagging with chipped paint and rusty signs out front. One person slowly walked down the sidewalk, lugging a bag of groceries. Nobody else was around. It was almost unnaturally still. I saw a sign for a hotel ahead. I didn't want to stop here, but dusk had arrived and there was no guarantee the next town would be any better. Gritting my teeth, I turned at the sign hoping that Pine Hotel wouldn't be a dive. I didn't see a hotel, but I saw another sign for it, with an arrow pointing down Pine Hotel Lane. Turning my car, I followed the narrow lane through the woods, where it ended in the hotel's parking lot. I felt relieved when I saw the building. It looked pretty respectable, although a bit old, like something built in the 1970s. There were a few other cars in the lot of 1980s vintage, I wasn't surprised a hotel off the beaten track wasn't busy. I carried my suitcase inside to check in, 
and a woman with puffy hair was behind the desk, wearing an outfit that reminded me of an 80s airline stewardess. Can I help you, sir? She asked cheerily. I just need a room for one night, I said. Of course, sir. I checked in, and she handed me a key. You don't see these much anymore, I said. She looked at me in a strange way, and then laughed. I don't know what else we'd have, she said. I thought that was an odd thing to say, but I shrugged, thanked her, and went up to my room. There were some people down the hallway talking, but besides that, the hotel was quiet. I'd already had dinner, so I decided to watch television before going to bed. I tried fiddling with it, but I only got static. Luckily, I'd brought a book, so I decided to read a little and go to bed early. I wanted to get on the road as soon as possible in the morning, and I was ready for this trip to be over. I woke the next morning to the sound of birds chirping and fluttering their wings. My eyes were still closed, and I thought they sounded awfully close by, almost right above me. I heard the fluttering sound again, this time right near my face. I opened my eyes, and sure enough, there was a bird in the room, flying back and forth. How the heck had it gotten in, I wondered. I was sure the window hadn't been open. I sat up and realized something was wrong. The room was in shambles, not as if someone had ransacked it, but as if it hadn't been touched in years. The wallpaper was peeling and covered in mold. Part of the ceiling had caved in, and ivy was growing through the broken window. There was not a sound besides the birds. What the hell was going on? I jumped out of my bed. My suitcase was where I had left it on the floor, and looked the same as usual. I pushed open the door, rotting and falling off its hinges, and looked into the hallway. It was dim, the only light coming from a window at the far end. Wires hung from the ceiling, and I could make some illegible graffiti on a door across from me. Besides the sounds from the birds, it was as quiet as a tomb. I rushed back into my room and looked out the window into the parking lot. My car was there in perfect condition, but surrounded by cracked tarmac, weeds, plastic bottles, and smashed cans. I could feel my heart beating. I didn't know what was going on, but I wanted to get out of there. Feeling creeped out and confused, I grabbed my suitcase and bolted out the door. I ran down the murky hallway, stumbled down the stairs, and charged across the parking lot to my car. Slamming the door, I leaned back against the seat, catching my breath. At least the car hadn't changed. I turned the key and was relieved that it started right away. Turning towards the lane, I put the pedal to the metal. It wasn't until I had driven out of town that I realized I was still in my pajamas. Once I was out of the mountains and comfortable on a road among strip malls and fast food outlets, I pulled over and took out my phone. I had to look up the Pine Hotel online. There had to be some explanation. I went to Google and typed Pine Hotel, West Virginia in the search bar. The only thing I could find was a short thread, Lucky Duck 02. I remember when I was a kid staying in a hotel called Pine Hotel in West Virginia, when we were going to the beach, is that still around? Can't find anything on it online or TripAdvisor. Marty Q. Oh yeah, I stayed there too, but it closed in 1988. Our home is the place where we should feel the safest. The place where we can just lie in our bed, pretending that the horrors of the outside world don't exist. This means that when someone decides to break into our homes and take that safe haven from us, it can be terrifying. Made even worse when that person decides that he or she is ready to hurt you just to get what they want. This was a reality for the brothers Roger and Soon Lindbergh on the 14th of April of 2004 when they came home to their farm in northern Sweden on a winter day. Roger and Soon lived on a farm in the small and calm village of Kalamark in the county of Norbotten, far away from the big Swedish cities of Stockholm, Gothenburg and Malmö. The 14th of April 2004 began like any other day. The Lindbergh brothers had been shopping before visiting friends. They then returned to their farm, where unbeknownst to them, an intruder was hidden somewhere on the farm. Roger went to the barn to check on the animals, while Soon lay in the bed to rest. The next thing he knew, Soon woke up to a masked man entering the house, who ordered him to lie down on the floor. Soon obeyed. Where's the safe? the man shouted. What do you care? Soon answered. See, the man shouted, there's blood on the floor, and there shall be more. 
When the social worker Maria came to check on Roger and Sue after not having had contact with them for a few days, she saw through a window Soon lying on the floor. His arms were tied and he was covered in blood. He was dehydrated after lying on the floor for several days without being able to drink. Maria opened the door with the key she had, saw that Soon was alive and called an ambulance and her fellow social worker, Karina, Soon kept repeating that Roger was in the barn. So when Karina and the ambulance arrived, they went to the barn to check. There they found Roger on the floor. He had been hit eight times on the back of his head and hadn't survived the attack. Such a horrific event in a small place like Calamark sent shockwaves throughout Nordmorton, and there was an enormous pressure to find the culprit. The surviving brother, Soon, had named a person he suspected of attacking him and his brother. It was Bertel, a salesman, Soon described as an extremely difficult and unpleasant man. Bertel was arrested and brought to the police station, along with his friend Nils, who was also a person of interest in the investigation. Both Bertel and Nils mentioned a man named Kajalina, an acquaintance to both of them, and like Bertel was a salesman. Nils told the police he had heard Kaj talk about committing a robbery in Kalamark that escalated to murder. Bertel and Nils were let go and the search for Kajalina began. Kajalina was at the time a 40 year old salesman Kaj was on his way from Sweden to the UK by train and bus on a business trip. Little did Kaj know that on this trip to the UK, a 13 year long nightmare that he never could have imagined would begin. While in Amsterdam waiting to catch his bus to London, Kaj entered an internet calf where he sat down to read the news. While reading the local news from his home in Norbotten, he was drawn to an article about a murder in the village of Kalamark. He was drawn to this article because he had, a few years prior, done business in the village. More precisely, he had sold a safe to the brothers Roger and Soon Lindbergh, which turned out to be the very safe the brothers' attacker was there to steal. As Cad read the article, he understood that it was the brothers who had been murdered. Further down in the article, Cad read that the police knew who the culprit was, and that it was just a matter of time before he was caught. A shiver ran down Cad's spine, when he started reading the police's description of the culprit. He understood that he was the suspect. The worst thing was that he wasn't really just a suspect. The police were completely sure he was guilty. With no interest in handing himself over to a police force who was so sure he was guilty of a crime he was in fact innocent of, Kaj decided to continue his journey to the UK. He was subsequently arrested in Swansea, Wales and extradited back to Sweden. In one of the biggest scandals in Swedish legal history, Kaj Linna was sentenced to life imprisonment with practically no evidence for the murder of Roger Lindbergh and the assault of Soon Lindbergh. The only thing that the police had on Kaj was the testimony of the unreliable witness, Nils, who had said that a few days prior to the murder, Kaj had said he planned a robbery on Roger and Soon, something that was later proven not to be correct in 2005, the investigating journalist who mainly focuses on crimes, Stefan Lesinski, started digging deeper into the case after realizing how weak, or should we say non-existent, the evidence towards Kaj Lina was. It would take him 13 years, but eventually in 2017, Stefan had gathered enough evidence of Kaj's innocence to make the courts reopen the case and exonerate him. But since then, the police in Norbotten and the Swedish police in general have been very disinterested in finding the real culprit of the horrific murder of Roger Lindbergh and the horrific assault of Soon Lindbergh. And this brings us to the disturbing realization that if alive, the culprit, or maybe even culprits, are probably free and could be anyone's neighbor, friend, or family member. The first night of rain after the dry season was always the best feeling. I would seat in front of the wide windows of the apartment, all the lights out, staring outside at the green area between the buildings. All the expectation from the last few days finally coming to a relief. The smell of moist in the air, the wind slightly colder, the grey sky by the day and the pink sky by night. It is like the sky is giving us a warning. Hey, prepare your favourite blanket. Don't make plans for the next couple of nights. Stay inside and make tea. I would stare at the lightnings from inside and under the blanket. 
It felt like no matter how crazy it is outside, everything is okay here, and you are allowed not to care about anything, but with keeping cozy. The last weeks of September brought not only the rain, it brought a whole atmosphere of almost over. More than 90% of the world wouldn't know what it feels like to have spring and summer in the last months of the year. When you are young, it means not only summer is coming, but the best holidays too. We have summer vacation, Christmas, New Year's Eve all together. No more classes. Outside, the plants come back to life. No more black pollution skies and no more dust. The families go to the coast, the days are spent by the beach, and by sundown, the summer rain came to give us a little break from the hot weather. With the world running out of clean water, the last few years were especially difficult during the dry seasons, which only made us thirstier for the first rain. With time we came to discover, it was not only us, it first started somewhere in South Africa. Those things started rising from the ground like zombies, desperately looking for a drip of water of the rain. The things have no protection from the sun, which made them hide back in the underground tunnels during the day. They have no eyes, no ears, no nose, but one big mouth. Apparently, while we dig deeper and deeper looking for clean water, managing to exhaust all the planet's resources, something else was digging up, and also looking for water. Like all living creatures in this world, it was impossible for them to live without water. So like the sinner sent to hell, asking Abram for water from Lazarus' fingers, they begged us, and in our greed we denied. But instead of living in torture, they kept coming up, reminding us that we are not gods, and this is not heaven, and the demons can reach us whenever they want. Here down south, the closer we get to the end of September, the more we can feel the earth vibrate, warning us that they are back for the yearly revenge. The dry season is almost over, the first rain is almost here again, and now we are only sacred animals, mortals made of 70% water. I was about six years old, around 1984-ish. The house we lived in had issues. It was a duplex, and we lived on the bottom floor. The duplex had a shared basement. This basement was absolutely enormous, with a very high ceiling. Near the top of the ceiling were a row of partially painted, makeshift privacy windows, which let in orange-tinted light during daylight hours. When you are small, something like this seems flat-out cathedral-like. The basement was so large that in the winter months, me and my sister would ride big wheel bikes in laps down there. Of course, when it got dark outside, nobody wanted to be down there. In fact, due to some disturbing experiences my parents had in the basement, we were forbidden to go down there after a certain hour anyway. I would find out that the daylight hours offered no respite. I had just completed a circuit on my bike in the basement. My progress was marked by a big support pylon near the stairs. There was, for some reason, a white handprint made of paint on the black metal surface of the pylon. Not really important to the story, just a detail I remember well. My memory of what happened next is fragmented but still intense. From behind the furnace, a tangible looking yet grotesque figure emerged and ran at me. I can't remember much about the thing as far as details. It was burned, skeletal. Scraps of seared clothing may have been clinging to it. If I could compare it to anything, it was like the Star Weirds from the Star Wars EU. Google that and imagine a six-year-old only a few feet in proximity to such a thing. The being stood there with its arms raised menacingly, its jaw opened in a silent roar of malice. At least it made no sound, so that part didn't add to my trauma. And then it was gone, and then I was gone, running up the stairs screaming. Thirty years passed, and I was more or less getting on with life. The duplex was literally just a memory at this point. The house and the entire neighborhood were raised to build a high-end shopping center years ago. You can never go home, but you can shop there. It was around Halloween, and I was riding shotgun with my stepbrother and his friends. He was kind of into visiting so-called paranormal sites at the time, and he just randomly blurts out, Man, it's a shame your old house is gone. That place was messed up. We could, like, try and go there. I kind of turned to him and questioned what he meant. After all, he'd been in that house only for about an hour or so, right before I moved in with my stepmom he had visited. One hour was all I needed. Remember when you saw me running into the living room? I went down to the basement and saw this, Cinderman standing by the furnace, looking at me. 
I thought it was you. I just know this. It was burned like ashes. I took off. I had never told him about the thing. Adult me had written all of it off as a childish flight of fancy. Every child has a boogeyman after all, with the building long gone, whatever secrets it had are lost to the ages, and hopefully, whatever that was, if it was, found some rest. One night when I was ten, I was asleep in bed and was woken by the bedroom door opening, then someone sitting on my bed. I felt the graze on my leg and the bed sank as they sat. Thinking it was my mum having something to tell me, I opened my eyes only to see a pale, eyeless, just black empty socket boy who seemed to be my age sitting at the foot of my bed with his legs crossed staring at me or facing my direction since he had no eyes. He then reached his hand towards me and he was holding what looked like a little black box. I was freaked out, but as I reached to grab it, he hesitantly pulled back. I reached out further for it and said, give it. As I did so, I blinked, and by the time I reopened my eyes, he was gone. The spot of the bed where he was sitting lifted back into place, but the imprint of someone sitting there was still present. I told my mum in the morning, and she was slightly freaked out, but assured me I was just dreaming. Fast forward five years, I had my girlfriend over to do homework. After homework, she took a nap while she waited for her parents to pick her up. When they arrived, I tried waking her to let her know. I nudged her and she opened her eyes so suddenly, already looking in the direction of the corner of the room where the wall meets the ceiling, lifting her finger and pointing. And as fast as she woke, she fell asleep again. I attempted to wake her again, she came to full consciousness, and I asked her what the hell that was about, and explained what she did. She said, oh I thought I was dreaming, but on the wall I saw a little boy with no eyes, just there in a Spider-Man pose staring at me. That's when I freaked out, and told her the story for the first time, of when I saw what I guessed was the same kid. Fast forward another five years, still with the same girlfriend, and by this time we had a two-year-old daughter, we were living in my old bedroom at my parents' house. My daughter would wake up at the same time every night and start talking. For a while, we thought it was a normal baby thing until I noticed it was almost the same conversation every night. I playfully asked her one night who she was talking to every night. She responded, a little boy, he talks to me, he's nice, he's lost and looking for his mummy. I told my mum what happened the next morning, and before I got to tell her what I thought, she said, I remember when that happened to you, then your girlfriend, I have no idea what it is. By then, neither my girlfriend or I have seen the little boy after our first encounter, but my daughter continued her nightly conversations until we got our own place later that year. When I was little, I would always spend Christmas at my grandparents' house. I shared their loft bedroom with my identical twin sister. My twin and I fought so much growing up, and when we left home, we lost touch with each other, but continued to go to Nana's for Christmas. This became the only time I ever saw her. This one year, when I was in my early 20s, I missed that train I always took across to Nana's, and I had to wait a long time for the next one. I just knew I'd be the last one to arrive. By the time I got to the house, it was dark. As I walked up the path to the front door, I noticed how quiet the house was, and thought it most odd that the only light visible came from the attic window. I set my suitcase down on the porch and knocked on the door. There was no sound from within, except the echoes of the knocker striking the door. I made my way around the house to the kitchen door at the back, as the moon appeared from behind the thick clouds, full and shining bright. My hand shook as I twisted the handle. I'd never seen my grandparents' house so still before. The door fell open easily and I stepped inside, leaving it gaping behind me. Hello, I called out. Nana. Silence. Is anyone there? I reached for the light switch that I knew was on the wall just inside the door, but it wasn't there. I know the house like the back of my hand, but the darn thing was not where it should have been. I ran my hand up and down that wall and all over, but didn't feel the light switch. When I tentatively stepped across the room, I bumped into something I wasn't expecting to be there and fell over this great big thing, a table right there in the middle of the room. My grandparents never changed anything about their house, 
Where did this table come from? Just then, a figure holding a lit candle appeared in the kitchen doorway. She walked over to the now closed back door and slid the bolt across. Then she turned the key that was sat in the lock, slipped it into her pocket and turned to leave again. Excuse me, I called out to her. Not only did she not appear to have heard me, but she didn't seem to have noticed my existence at all. I followed her out of the kitchen and up a small flight of stairs, very much like a servant staircase that I didn't know was there. When we reached the upper level, she carried on going up, but I didn't. I opened the door and stepped out into the corridor, shutting the door behind me. The upper hallway was lit by a couple of candle lamps on the walls. I strode along the corridor, taking it in. It was like a completely different house. I noticed a dim light shining around the slightly open door of a nearby room and went in. It was a child's room, complete with sleeping children. There was a candle sat burning on the mantel above the Victorian fireplace, which contained orange coals and a double bed on the opposite wall. I walked up to the bed and studied the young girls laid in it. Both had long blonde curls and identical faces. I touched my own blonde curls and felt a shiver run down my spine. They couldn't be more than six years old. The girls were both laid on their sides, facing each other, so I gently lifted the hair of the girl closest to me in order to get a look at her neck. She had a birthmark, just like my nana's. The little girl sighed in her sleep and flipped an arm, so I lay above her head on the pillow. I stepped back and walked around the bed to look closely at the other girl. Twins ran in families, and my sister and I were always being told how much we resembled nana as a child, but as far as I knew, she never had a sister. What's going on? I paused in front of the fireplace and stared into the candle flame. There was a mirror behind the candle and the flame reflected in it. I blinked my eyes into focus and stared past the flame into the mirror. Only the candle flame and the painting hanging on the wall above the bed behind me were reflecting back. That's when I fainted. When I came to, I was cold, so cold. Shivering, I opened my eyes and sat up, looking around. The room was dark, the fireplace was still there, but coals no longer burned. The big bed was covered with a dust sheet and the rest of the furniture. I stood up. The window was boarded up and thin slithers of light shone between the slats, lighting up the dust in the room. I looked at the mirror, but could see nothing reflecting in it, for all the dust covered it. I tried the door and it opened easily. Stood in the doorway, I saw a pretty lady coming down the corridor. She wore a red dress with huge skirts and her bust pushed up. Stepping out of the room, I pressed myself against the wall beside the door, uncertain if she could see me. She had frozen and stared at the door. I swiftly pulled it closely, keeping my eyes on her. The woman frowned and turned away, as if someone had called her name. When I looked back at the door i just stepped out of, I saw it was boarded up. Not only that, but it looked to have been that way for some time. A shiver ran down my spine as I turned and ran towards the stairs, seeking sanctuary in the attic. When I got upstairs, the familiar attic room as I was used to was only a little different. The strange thing was, I could almost see time passing. I swear the windows got dustier and dirtier the more seconds that passed, and a cobwebby haze slowly fell over the floor and the beds and everything. I walked slowly towards the window and peered through the gloom. It was foggy outside, thick fog, as if the house had been set down in a cloud. Pushing the window open, I listened for sound and heard nothing. A glance over my shoulder told me there was no one there, but I felt as if there had been. My attention was then drawn by happy children's cries outside. It was still as foggy as before, and I couldn't see anybody out there. Let's go up the tree, Ellie, says a little girl. Moments later, there is more laughter, followed by a sudden high-pitched scream. Elsa, screamed the little girl. There is the thud, accompanied by a simultaneous crack and crying. A shiver runs through me as I listen to a little girl crying out for Elsa over and over again, while sobbing and the sounds gradually fade away. Hearing a ruckus behind me, I look around and see the figure of a maid swinging from the ceiling. A deafening scream ripped from my throat and I ran from the house so quickly my feet hardly touched the steps on the way down. However, when I reached the back door, it wouldn't open, no matter how much I twisted the handle to and fro, or how hard I jiggled it. So I ran to the front door and threw it open easily. The fog was gone and dawn was approaching. 
I ran back to the train station and waited for the next one heading home. I was too scared to ever go back to that house. I later discovered that my nana, Elizabeth, had once had a twin. She died in an accident when they were little and was never talked about after her death. That was the Christmas my sister vanished. Nana and everybody else had been out looking for her when I was there, so the house had been empty. My twin had been there for a day and a night already when she disappeared, but all her stuff was still there. To this day, no trace of her has ever been found, 